find the beginnings of our story, we must go back in time. Back from the bustling cities of Australia's eastern seaboard, back from these monuments of concrete and steel that mark man's progress in a modern world. Back across the mountain ranges that for so many years had defied the early settlers in their quest for new lands. And then, back in giant steps across the world's greatest island continent, across centuries of silence, to a day when primitive man, living in the forest country on the westernmost corner of the land, fashioned from the hardwoods growing in that area the weapons and utensils he needed for his very existence. Here was the birthplace of the forest. Here the tiny saplings fought each other for a place in the sun, struggled upward for centuries of storms and seasons to become the giant heroes of our story. From the fairy tale and folklore of earliest history, the forest has been a forbidden land of magic and mystery. Here, set in an area of a few hundred square miles and nowhere else in the entire world, grow the wonderful trees that give to mankind the hardwood timbers known as Kari and Jarrah. Out of this forest, the mill town of Nanup has been carved set in a valley on the edge of an area where large stands of Jarrah are to be found. From the forest has come the timber for more than a hundred homes where families work and play alongside the modern timber mill that provides them with their livelihood. This is a place where babies watch the treetops from their cradles and toddlers get sawdust in their shoes bringing home the family firewood. To the youngsters, this is commonplace. Trucks that summer and winter bring load upon load of Jarrah logs on their one-way trip to the mill. Day after day, since 1912, great logs like these have been rolled and jostled at the offloading ramps. Millions of feet of timber ready to be converted to the needs of a world market. This red-coloured hardwood used to be called mahogany and it wasn't until about 1840 that the name Jarrah, given it by the Aborigines, was adopted. Jarrah is a name held in high esteem. In fact, the Jarrah forests of Western Australia yield many millions of cubic feet of sawn timber every year. Nanup is a modern mill. There is little waste. Even the sawdust has a part to play. Sucked up from the saws, it piles up in this bin 20 to 30 tonnes a day. It gets blown into furnaces to fire boilers producing steam, which in turn is converted into power. A battery of generators supply not only the electric power to operate the mill and supply the mill town, but also the adjacent township of Nanup itself. Lunch break over, the men of Nanup return to the mill. Meet Andy Nelson, twin sawyer and head of the rig. A man skilled in a craft that is centuries old, trained to know his six-foot saws and how to use them to get the most out of the Jarrah logs that come his way. The switches close and those 90 horsepower motors start to work. They call this a Simonson Turner. It can tumble a 15-ton log as if it were matchwood, then push it onto the carriage that will carry it past the twin saws. The twin saw assistant moves the dogs into position and secures the log in a vice-like grip. The width of the cut is set on the gauge. The log is on its way.
While the twin saw is breaking down the log into flitches, the number one bench takes a wing off the first flitch and then planks out the rest to size. Benchmen have a system of signalling their measurements. This means six off a ten. So the lever man sets his gauge and the balk of timber goes through the saw to make one or more six by ten inch planks. The planks roll onto the rip benches, the wings to the recovery benches of the mill, and finally the docking saws remove faults and cut to length. As the marks on the tally sheet grow, so do the stacks of timber in the yard. Quality timber destined for every part of the world. The accepted method of air drying timber is to strip it out in stacks arranged so as to allow the free circulation of air. This is a slow process and at Nanup the seasoning is speeded up in a battery of modern steam heated kilns. Flooring timber is subjected to controlled heat for a period of five or six days with steam supplied from the sawdust fired boilers, after which it is ready for machining without further treatment. Recently installed machinery has introduced to the industry a modern method of bonding lengths of hardwood. The kiln dried timber is first dressed for thickness. As the boards pass across this docking saw, any faulty timber is rejected and perfect timber in various sizes, one foot or longer, is stacked for the next operation. The rapidly revolving jointing head on this machine shapes the end to form two finger-like projections which give the process its name, finger jointing. The opposite ends of the boards are then passed through another jointing head which makes a matching end and applies a coating of special glue. The timber is then fed through rollers and pressure applied to the finger joints, the glue making a scientifically designed bond which is as strong as the timber itself. A fact that is clearly indicated when boards with a number of joints can be picked up and stacked immediately they leave the machine. The bonding is permanent after a period of 12 hours, the time taken for the glue to set. Finally, the Jarrah boards are dressed, milled and cut to length, ready to be packaged as high quality flooring. The Jarrah we have watched through the mill finishes with an attractive warm colour. This would be a good time to look at another timber we will be telling you about, carry. At first glance, the two timbers appear identical, both almost the same in colour, both hardwoods. Only when we see their structure with the help of the microscope is the difference apparent. In this cross section of Jarrah, the large holes, which are the pores, are arranged in solitary fashion and the cells are blocked with gummy deposits, a close textured, dense timber. On the other hand, Carrie has the pores arranged in oblique groups, shows denser fibres and a relative absence of gum deposits. In Western Australia, one of these timbers, Jarrah, is a veritable solution for all timber problems. Its durability and strength makes it excellent for railway sleepers and for bridge construction. It has been employed to such an extent that there is scarcely a wharf, pier or jetty in Western Australia that is not constructed almost wholly of Jarrah. In fact, the quantity of Jarrah produced annually exceeds that of any other single species in Australia. Jarrah is most satisfactory as a building timber, being used for joists, weatherboards, plates, studs, rafters, linings, frames, doors and joinery. You'll find Jarrah floors in King's Hall, Canberra, the City Hall, Brisbane, even in London's Bank of England. Jarrah has the durability and beauty, but when it comes to brute strength, carry is the king. This fact is demonstrated by a testing experiment in the Perth University Laboratory. A length of carry is set up in a testing press and as the pressure is applied, this dial registers in pounds per square inch the weight it can hold up to the moment of fracture. Carry has the strength of a giant and that's exactly what it is. 
land of the giants, the Cary country, where for thousands of years this unique timber has been growing to maturity, a heritage that is now under government protection. Since 1918, the Western Australian Forest Department has taken over the management of all state forest timber. Under its care, seed trees are left standing so that the forest may be reborn. This regrowth is probably from the parent trees in the background. To prevent destruction of the Cary Forest by bushfires, a fire watching service has been set up. Pat Evans, fire watcher, has one of the most unique jobs in Australia. Every day during the bushfire season, Pat climbs this forest giant to her lookout tower 200 feet above the ground. It all began when Pat used to deliver lunch to the fire watcher in the tree with the name of Evans. Now she's Mrs. Evans, and after she sees the children off to school, she carries out a vital duty in her lofty perch, protecting the Cary Forest from its most dreaded enemy, the bushfire. Far below her, in every direction, government foresters are busily engaged in their vital duties. The government foresters are the guardians of this kingdom of the Cary. They are trained in the complex profession of forestry and are university graduates in the faculty. They alone decide the fate of the trees, for only those trees marked by the forester may be cut. And so that other trees are not damaged, the forester indicates the direction in which they are to be felled by marking the trunks with a government stamp, a toe mark. The forester and the field officer from the mill together cast a professional eye over the marked tree. Dickie Dean, through long experience, can tell the amount of timber in it, just where it should fall, and more importantly, just how it will be got out of the forest. Gone are the days when brawny axemen battled with these forest giants. Today, the tiny one-man chainsaw topples the tallest tree in a matter of minutes. Removal of the scarf reveals the natural beauty of this fine timber. After centuries of reaching upwards to the clouds, this huge tree now lies prone on the forest bed, humbled by puny man and his chainsaw. The next move is to get it from the forest. No easy task with a tree measuring 200 feet overall and 140 feet clear to the first limb. The tree is crowned off and select crown logs will be cut for plywood. This timber is too...